Hi class, welcome to week four's lecture. This week we're going to talk about traditional screening and identification instruments. Last week we talked about, if you'll recall, procedures that are involved in identification. And those uh, were divided into three stages. Stage one consisted of universal screening and or nomination. Stage two consisted of individualized assessment, the gathering of data to create a student portfolio. And stage three consisted of the child study team meeting and uh, reviewing the assessment information and either making a decision if this district offers programs to place that students in a gifted program or not. This week we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about some types of instruments or tests. When I say instruments, you should think tests or assessments that are used in the identification of gifted students. So we're going to be talking about several topics. First, we're going to get into a category called norm reference or a criterion reference test. And we're going to try to understand the difference between those. We're going to talk about the difference between aptitude tests and achievement tests. We're going to talk a little bit about one kind of aptitude test called the cognitive test. And then we're going to get into specific instruments. First of all, let's talk about two categories of tests, norm reference or criterion reference. Norm reference tests are usually tests that involve comparisons to other students. Um, so what happens is test makers will create a, a pool of questions that they test out on eventually tens of thousands of students, and they run some statistical analyses on these. And then they will um, get typical responses. So for example, in the SAT, they'll see about how what percentage of students get certain questions right. So they know and they understand how a large pool of student answers these questions. When you take the SAT as a student, they can compare your response to a nationwide student pool to see where you stand. Are you in the 63rd percentile, the 99th percentile. Criterion reference tests, though, involve comparisons to one or more learning standards. So in these tests, which are, for example, often state tests, they say they have goals for students or standards, and they want students to be able to master that standard. A typical standard, for example, in science, might be that students will uh, be able to explain the difference between um, natural selection and evolution. And so a student can either do that or not do that, depending on how he answers the question. And so the, the student's progress isn't compared against other students, it's compared about against a specific, yes or no, have they met that criterion? Have they mastered that standard? Let's think about each of these tests. It'll give us a little practice as to, and try to classify them as either norm or criterion reference tests. So remember, a norm reference test compares students against other students, and a criterion reference test compares students against the standard. So what do you think an advanced placement test is? Is that norm reference or is that criterion referenced? That's CR, or criterion reference, because advanced placement courses try to teach to standards, and they test students on those standards. They're not comparing them against other students. What about the SAT? We've already touched on this. That is a norm reference test, because it compares your score against all the other students in the test pool to see where you fall. Maybe some of you have heard of this. The National Assessment of Educational Progress is a test given to certain school districts um, in usually in grades four and eight, and it's sometimes called the nation's report card. So what do you think that would be? Would it be criterion referenced or norm referenced? It too is a criterion reference test because it is measuring students' understanding of standards that are in place. 
Similarly, the trends in international mathematics and science studies measures students' knowledge of science and math. And this test is given and compared against international students. But it also is a criterion reference test because there are standards and students either understand and know the standards, have mastered the goals and objectives of the standards, or they haven't. What about a WISC IQ test? You recall maybe that IQ tests ask students to do certain tasks, and we're going to talk about them a little more later. They might, example, for example, ask you to do analogies, or they might ask you to do um, mental rotation, where you take an object and you have to mentally rotate it 90 degrees. You would think that would be a criterion reference, but actually it's a norm reference because they're not comparing you to standards. They're comparing you to a huge pool of people who have taken this test to know where you stand in terms of IQ. The average IQ score is 100, by the way, on most of these tests. And so if you score 100, you know you're right in the middle of IQ. What about the GRE? Many of you may have taken the GRE to get into grad school. The GRE, unlike the SAT, is a norm reference test. That might seem a little odd, but it's actually because of the way they do it in terms of comparing you to other students. The Common Core State Standards Test, or the state test, what do you think they would be? They're criterion reference, because like the NAEP and the TEMS, they compare your, your understanding against a body of knowledge, against a standard. What about a driving test? If you drive, you may remember going out and having to pass a driving test. And your instructor was rating you. Is that a norm referenced or criterion referenced? That's criterion referenced. Think about it. Your, your, your driving evaluator was checking off whether you put the brake on when you stopped, whether you used your turn signal, whether you checked in the mirror when you backed up. Those are all standards of a type that you have to master. He or she was not comparing you against all the other students that had taken the driving test. Pediatric growth charts, are they norm referenced or criterion referenced? They're norm referenced, primarily because when you go in and bring your baby into a doctor's office and they measure the growth of the baby, they're comparing that growth with all the other babies that have gone through this. And they know, you know, within a range where a baby should be in terms of height and weight. So that's norm referenced. And finally, the Regents exam in New York is a criterion reference test, again, because it's measuring knowledge of certain standards. So I hope this cl helped clarify the difference between norm and criterion reference tests. In addition to those categories, there are other two other categories we need to understand. Aptitude tests and achievement tests. Aptitude tests predict students' abilities. They try to uncover student potential. So for example, IQ test is an aptitude test because it's trying to figure out your abilities, for example, to mentally rotate objects. It's not trying to uncover your memorization of the state capitals, for example, which is what we're going to get to next. Within those aptitude tests, and we're going to talk about some general cognitive ability tests. These are special aptitude tests that measure students' ability to think, reason, and learn. They generally discount or filter out the effects of learning achievement. So this is just their potential or ability to learn. They focus on aptitude or potential. Whereas achievement tests measure students' knowledge and skills, things they have been taught. Iowa Test of Basic Skills uh, is a commonly used achievement test by some school districts, and usually in math and reading. The state tests are all achievement tests. 
because they measure your progress against standards, usually common core. So aptitude and achievement tests, another type of category you need to understand. Let's talk about general cognitive ability instruments. So these are fall into the category of aptitude tests. They're also generally normative. They compare student scores with other in a large sample. So for example, IQ tests, they know the general range of IQs in a large number of the population. And so if you score in a particular uh, area, they know where you fall. And sometimes they classify that as a percentile. If you are in the 99th percentile, for example, you scored better than, as well as or better than 99% of other students. We know that IQ, which stands for intelligence quotient, correlates with educational, social, and occupational outcomes. Different tests, though, define intelligence differently. So if you think about it, intelligence is kind of a social construct. So that means that we've created it. We say, OK, it, it's important to be able to mentally rotate objects. It's important to be able to, to reason through with analogies. But we could have just as easily said other things were as important, too. And so that's why some researchers in the field of IQ and IQ testing actually come out and state this is not, this is almost meaningless because it doesn't really take into account the wide range of potential skills and aptitudes that are in the human population. So you know, must know what it is you're assessing. As I said previously, most IQ tests have a mean score, that means average, of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 or 16. So what does that mean? Let's talk about that for a minute. So before you, you see what looks like a normal curve, this means that it looks like a hill. And it's not lumpy on one side or another. So we call that a normal curve. It has a peak, and it falls off to either side. These are scores of people on, a, let's say, a test like an IQ test where you, you assess a large number of people in the population. You would expect the largest number of people to be at the average, right? Because most people are going to fall in the middle. And that's what the zero on that represents. It represents the peak of the curve. And if you imagine all people's scores piling up under that curve, most of the people will be at the mean or the average. And that's, that's not the number zero on the test. That means uh, zero here happens to mean the average. Now, if you slice the normal curve up into partitions, you can see going to the right and going to the left, you have sort of even slices. Um, and these are called standard deviations. So, so one thing we know about the normal curve is that we can see what percentage of people fall in each standard deviation. Let's start by going over to minus 3 and taking the percent of people in each standard deviation and adding them up and see what we get when we get to 0. So if you're at minus 3 or 3 standard deviations below the mean, we call, we say, you scored pretty lowly on the test. That's a very low score. And then from minus 3 to minus 2 is 2.5%. Two so only 2.5% of people score that lowly on the exam. Going up, though, you can see the curve rises and more, a little more people score between negative two standard deviations and negative one. So 13.5% people, that's not as bad a score, but it is still pretty low. Let's add those numbers. So 13.5% plus 2.5 gives you 16%. So 16% of people will score at or below negative one standard deviations. Now let's add up the next level up between negative 1 and the mean. 34%, all of a sudden we have a lot more people scoring there, just slightly below the mean. So let's take those standard deviate, let's say take those percentages and add them up. We had 16, 16 and 34 is now 50%. So 
will score below the mean. So that's why it's the mean, right? Because it's, it's, it's the average it's where half of the people um, score below. Similarly, if you were to add up the percentages to the right, you would find the same thing. So 34% score between 0 and 1, standard deviation above, another 13.5% score between 1 and 2, and another 2.5% score between 2 and 3, and that's 50% as well. So 50% of people score at or below the mean, 50% of people score at or above the mean. So the mean on a standard deviation test is uh, at a score of 100. So if you were scoring right there at the zero, your actual score on the, on the test would be 100. Remember I said that a common standard deviation for most IQ tests is 15? Well, that means that if we go one above to the one standard deviation above, 100 plus 15 is 115. So those folks who are scoring right at the one standard deviation would score 115 on the test. Similarly, if you go to two, that's another 15 points on the test. That means those folks at two standard deviation above to the right of the mean would score 115 plus another 15 is 130. And finally, three would take you out to 145, another 15. You can actually see the percentages of people who fall into these categories. So you can see that 50% scored at or below the mean, as we said before, plus another 34% to the right to get to the first standard deviation. So that's 50% plus 34%. So 84% of people scored at one standard deviation above the mean, which we said was 115. So 84%, if you score at 115, you're scoring as well or, or better than 84% of people. Similar, if you push it to two standard deviations above, uh, you'll see at 130, that's the score, two standard deviations above, you have to add 84 and another 13 and a half, and that's 97.5. So if you score 130 on an IQ test, you're scoring better than 97.5% of people. Many districts will use an IQ score and they'll use a two standard deviation above the mean cutoff, usually 130. If you keep going up, you can see how fast the numbers fall away in terms of people scoring in those areas. Here's kind of a scary looking chart, but don't let it scare you because it just shows you the, uh, the top is the normal curve that you recognize, divided into those standard deviations. Don't let the statistical numbers fool you. It's the, basically the same numbers. And it shows you where we classify IQ scores in terms of high average, superior, very superior, and on the other side as well, low average, low, and deficient. There are other types of common uh, cognitive ability tests um, that have to do with, with IQ. So some of them are group administered, as I've mentioned in previous lectures. The cognitive abilities test is usually given at stage one, although it can be given at stage two, and is administered to a group of students to assess abstract reasoning. The OLSAT or the Otis Lennon School Ability Test is also a group aptitude test that measures verbal and practical mechanical abilities. You might have heard of that one. Usually individually administered tests are given at stage two. The Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children called the WISC is an actual IQ test. It tests uh, verbal comprehension so students can understand words, visual, spatial, fluid reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. And as I said, it's important to understand the particular constructs that each of these tests uh, measure because you want to figure into, you want to take that into account when you're, you're selecting tests for assessment of students for gifted program. The Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale, or the SB5, 
is a test that may be used with children as young as two years. There's some argument in the field about whether we should be IQ testing students that young, uh, particularly because some of this appears to be developmental. And so students might actually be shooting ahead in their development, but later others will catch up. And so there's some controversy about assessing students that young. The Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, or the PPVT4, gives an individual quick estimate of verbal ability. So those are cognitive tests, but what about achievement instruments? So achievement instruments that are commonly used usually measure learned knowledge and skills, if you'll recall. Um, they may have national norms calculated on grade or age, and most are group tests, but some are individually administered. But you'll remember these achievement tests are usually criterion reference tests because they're assessing what has been learned against a standard. Here are some group administered achievement tests. You might see these during universal screening, or you might see them in stage two. Iowa Test of Basic Skills, ITBS, which you've heard me talk about, is grades K to eight. They measure achievement in English language arts, math, science, and social studies. The MAP is a norm referenced, sort of the exception adaptive computer test. The SAT um, is originally designed as an aptitude test, but research suggests it may be more of an achievement test because you can study for it. So in the little quiz I gave you before, I did say that it was, um, an, it was a, a, an achievement test. It, its aptitude is, is one of the things that it does measure. Uh, so there is some controversy in this, but it's perfectly fine to think of it as an achievement test. Subject-specific achievement tests, key math, three, diagnostic, for example, and there are others um, are also achievement tests that may be given. Some individually administered achievement tests includes the Wexler Individual Achievement Test or the Wyatt 3. This one has 16 what are called subscales or questions that are clustered together to measure particular domains. And they measure things like oral language, reading, written language, and math. So you don't have to use the whole test. You can use the subscale if you're just looking at math, for example. It's good for pinpointing strengths and weaknesses. The Peabody Individual Achievement Test, the PIOT, has six subtests that measure general information, reading recognition, reading comprehension, math, spelling, and written expression. So those were, that was a little bit about testing, and let's go over some key ideas. Traditional identification instruments include checklists, rating scales, and assessments that measure achievement and aptitude. They may be normative or criterion reference. They may measure aptitude or achievement, and it's important to understand which your test is assessing. If a student gets a high score on an aptitude test, like an IQ test, doesn't necessarily mean they've learned a lot. And cognitive instruments assess students' ability or aptitude to think in certain ways, whereas achievement instruments assess what students have learned. So in this week's um, module, you're going to be applying some of these con concepts to do some, some work and a critical reflection. Everybody have a great week.